Welcome to Articulate This, where we explore the minds behind innovation. Today we're delving into the world of biochar with Sophie Dagger, co-founder of Biosora, a trailblazer in carbon capture technologies. Biochar, a form of charcoal, is more than just a soil enhancer. It's a beacon of hope in our battle against climate change. Produced through pyrolysis, biochar captures carbon from biomass, locking it away and reducing greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. But how did this ancient technique become a modern day climate solution? Sophie's journey from bioscience engineer to sustainability pioneer holds the key. Through her work in food and agriculture, Sophie realized the urgent need for effective carbon capture methods and turned her focus to biochar. The company she founded, Biosara, not only champions biochar production, but also leads the way in sustainable agriculture practices and waste management. In this episode, Sophie shares the inspiring story of Biosora, the challenges they face, and their successful expansion into Kenya. Join us as we explore the potential of nature-based solutions like biochar in our global effort to mitigate climate change. Let's learn, grow, and make a difference together. This is Articulate This with Sophie Dagger. Let's get into it. Hey, Sophie, how are you? Hi, Pat. Good. Good to be here. So tell me a little bit about your early life in Belgium and what initially sparked your interest in bioscience, engineering and sustainability. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So from an early age, I've always loved being outside and being in nature. And I was lucky enough to grow up in one of the few forested areas in Flanders. There's not very many. Um, my family and I, we spent most of our holidays in Switzerland, just camping in the summer, skiing in the winter. And so I, I grew up being in nature and ever since learning about climate change in, in primary school, I've had the urge to protect that in some way. And I guess that's why biology was always my favorite subject. Um, funnily enough though, um, I was urged to pursue language and social science because that's where my academic strengths were at the time. Um, but passion prevailed and I decided to study bioscience engineering uh, because in my head, that's where the solutions to climate change were to be found. So you, you've had a diverse career in food and uh, agriculture. So how do these experiences shape your understanding of sustainability and lead you towards carbon capture technologies? Yeah, so straight out of university, I got a job at a huge Belgian wholesaler for fruits and vegetables, and they supply most of the supermarket chains in the country. Uh, and it was a bit of a rude awakening. So the sustainability aspect was not really present, um, as I found out when I was at one point put in charge of, um, yeah, of sourcing the organic produce for the market. So fruits and vegetables were brought in from all over the world. And even though they were also grown in our own country, uh, just to save a buck, basically. So there was so much waste because of insufficient quality. Um, and there was enormous amounts of plastic packaging. And I decided then that I needed to shift my focus to making the food and agriculture sector more sustainable. Uh, and limiting carbon emissions in that way. And it was only later that I found out about biochar and its abilities to capture and sequester carbon. So that, that's that's perfect segue, because I was just about to ask you, like you, you have quality assurance, yeah, you have sales, scientific research in your background. So what was that that motivated you to pivot towards uh, biochar and climate change mitigation? Yeah, so yeah, so as I said, I was I was working in food production and agriculture for a couple of years. And then at that, I was at that point where I realized that sustainability in, this, in the industry wasn't at the level that I had maybe naively assumed before. So um, that's, that's when I decided to go back to school and study sustainability and specifically social, environmental and economic sustainability. 
Because looking at sustainability from a science perspective, I found often isn't enough. So a scientific solution to a climate related problem may not necessarily work from a social and economic perspective. And I think that's the main challenge here. So creating sustainable like climate solutions that make sense economically and benefit society in the process. And I think it was around that time that I learned about biochar. So for, for people that are not familiar with, with biochar uh, and um, are new to the topic, can you explain like what it is, the significance in addressing climate change? Yeah. So, um, yeah, biochar is basically um, a charcoal made from organic waste. And what it does is it, it really sequesters carbon in the soil. So it captures carbon in the soil. And basically to stop climate change and its tracks, we need to currently evolve to a climate neutral society. And the Paris Agreement wants to limit global warming to well below two degrees Celsius, like ideally 1.5, but sounds like that will be hard to achieve, um, but like to achieve at least the two degrees Celsius um, rise, greenhouse gas emissions need to be brought back to zero by 2050. And out of all the greenhouse gases, CO2 is the most commonly emitted. So obviously it's not easy or even possible at this point to completely stop CO2 emissions. So we will have to resort to finding ways of removing existing CO2 from the atmosphere to get to net zero. And that's where biochar can really help because it just it, it's not about limiting um, CO2 emissions as much as actually removing them out of the atmosphere. So uh, that's where biochar plays a huge role right now. Talk a little bit more about uh, what makes it a unique solution. Like I, I kind of came across biochar uh, at the beginning of the pandemic through when we, we were all were trying to find new hobbies to keep us uh, busy. And I, I saw... Uh, what it can do for your for your garden, uh, with what it can do with making your fr uh, your vegetables, your fruits, your vegetables, a lot more flavorful. So, uh, how does it play more um, in from that unique solution for, for battling carbon carb uh, battling carbon capture, and also what other benefits do you see it uh, perform? Yeah. So, so there's really multiple ways of removing carbon from the atmosphere. So, biochar is not the only product here, but there's so many like high tech options like direct air capture, where basically like huge fans take it out of the atmosphere and then store it underground. There's been like so many processes, but they're really costly. And that kind of poses a barrier to make them white to make their use widespread. So then there's like nature based solutions like like ocean and reef restoration, reforestation um, and as it happens, like trees capture carbon through photosynthesis and store it. Um, but then when a tree dies and naturally decomposes, that CO2, that carbon is released back into the atmosphere. Um, and that's where biochar really comes in. So biochar is taking this woody material or any kind of organic waste, really, and then turning it into a charcoal-like substance. And because of this stable form of carbon, it can keep up to thousands of years in the soil. And that makes it like a far more durable form of carbon removal. And as you said, you could use it, you could create it yourself in your backyard. It's really not that hard to do. Obviously, there's like huge differences in, in technology and, and the like the higher advanced, the more advanced your production facility becomes, the more carbon is the more carbon content your biochar will have, and the more stable it will become. So that those are things to take into consideration. In itself, it's really an easy sort of process. Yeah. Where I was going to go next is because you were leading perfectly into you know the technical details. Like, how do you break down? Uh, can you break down the production process for us, uh, focusing on on feedstock and. Uh, uh, it's incredibly difficult to pronounce. I can't. <laughs> but let, let's go from the low tech uh, that someone can do in their backyard to what you're what you're seeing cutting edge do. Because the way the way I saw it being created in uh, online for the people in the garden is basically taking uh, a premium bag of charcoal that you would use for your barbecue and then soak it in water and, and make it from there. So can you expand more on like the production process, uh, how it's made? 
Yeah, well, well, that's a funny story, actually, because when we first started the biochar project um, and we had we had the idea, it was already there. And then we got into this accelerator that was supposed to help us bring it to the next level. And we were working on it on site and we had never actually held biochar. And then we were doing some like promo for, you know, our idea there and to help people get used to the idea of a charcoal. And uh, we were walking as a team past, um, they were doing a barbecue at the venue where we were, where we were speaking. And we walked past a bag of the, the barbecue charcoal and we kind of took a few pieces out, put it in our hand and made a photo. And that's like, that's a bio, that was our first biochar photo. It wasn't actually biochar, it was charcoal, which is very similar. Um, but yeah, so that, that was a, that, that reminded me of what you were saying about um, barbecue charcoal. <laughs> so just in itself, it's a really easy sort of process. So you take any kind of biomass, you heat it up to very high temperatures in a low oxygen environment and bam, you got biochar. So that's what's called the pyrolysis process. And so basically pyrolysis is the process of heating organic material without oxygen and the temperature is usually above 500 degrees Celsius. Um, but biochar comes in many different shapes. And as I was said earlier, not all biochar is created equal. So in the more basic production methods, the temperature doesn't always reach 500 degrees. In fact, it can be as low as 300 degrees. Or in some cases, there's not a complete absence of oxygen and all of these things decreases the carbon content of the biochar. Um, doesn't make it less, doesn't not make it biochar, but the quality of it decreases, obviously. Uh, so also things that matter when thinking about like quality of biochar is the feedstock or organic matter that you use um, to create it. That also greatly impacts the properties of the biochar. Um, so for example, when using woody material, there will be a higher stable carbon content, but when you're using leafy material or even chicken manure, which is also possible, uh, you will have a lower carbon content, but pro probably higher contents of particular nutrients such as potassium in the case of manure. Um, and those can also have beneficial effects on soil fertility. So basically those are kind of, those are fertilizers in a way as well, or they can add nutrients to the soil beyond carbon. So that, that was going to be actually one of my follow-up questions because I remember, let's say 20 plus years ago when organics, organic sort of produce was hitting the markets more mainstream and scientific research was coming out saying, well, there's no real nutritional value that's different from organics versus pesticide based uh, um, foods. But to the point you just said, I think there's, there's a lot more, I don't even know what you call it, but the, uh, people swear by the flavor uh, improve uh, improvements, like anything that's done in this sort of environment. So uh, comment on that or speak to any more that, that do we have any more science based information that could actually prove that it's a, uh, it's actually better for you versus uh, a pesticide uh, um, soil. Better for you is a, that's a, a question that's, difficult to answer. I, I know it's better for the soil. Okay. Um, because basically what fertilizers do is they bring in heaps of nutrients and um, nitrogen and potassium and um, all these nutrients that the that the plants need to grow. Um, but obviously, because of these high quantities, some of it seeps into the groundwater, some of it is like, uh, it's taken to the air. Um, and it's, it has many negative benefits on the environment. So high fertilizer use also, or high agriculture set in, it, in its own, just kind of depletes the soil of nutrients and you have to keep adding the fertilizer. What biochar does is it holds on to those nutrients. So the plants can take the nutrients that they need, but the rest of them is not washed away in the soil. Not as much, not nearly as much as it would be without the, the biochar. So that's what the carbon does. It, it, it adds structure to the soil. And um, that's really where the, 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 the benefits of biochar come in is that you need way less fertilizer to get the same effects. Um, and I think less fertilizer 
probably means better for the environment. I do not know about personal health benefits, um, but it could be. That's something, some research, research that I still have to do. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, at least from a, a le less chemicals coming in could be uh, the, the benefit. But to your point, um, still early. I, I, there's the, that's why it was always fascinating to me because, uh, um, you know, organic material, organic produce, um, it's been touted as healthier, but then there's always been the other side saying they're disputing it. So it's, to me, it's always been interesting. Um, let's talk more about like the history of biochar. Uh, my understanding is it's, it's, it's roots are from South America. Uh, how did this ancient practice evolve into like a modern, a modern climate, uh, solution? Um, yeah. So, um, biochar has been used in agriculture for, for, for thousands of years now. It was found in agricultural soils in the Amazon basin in South America and where that's where native people of the region would create charcoal and then mix it with. Uh, organic matter to enhance their agricultural soils. Um, those soils are now called terra preta, and they have this very significant um, dark charcoal color, and they remain highly fertile even after thousands of years. And that's why people have started to really replicate these soils enhancement techniques today, because they saw the benefits. Yeah, um, it's fascinating where um, I think we, we easily discount ancient civilizations for what they uh what they knew uh and some i think we're we're still just trying to figure things out and it's amazing how we come across these uh these ways of life that they were doing two thousand years ago a thousand however far back they kind of already knew it which is always fascinating to me uh so besides the carbon uh uh sir question where what are the benefits using biochar um so, well, apart from the, the climate impact, so biochar yeah. is a very stable long-term wave storing carbon. So that uh, that's that aspect. But as I said, it also has many agricultural advantages. So the, as I said, the carbon content improves the structure of the soil, which is super important. Also, when thinking about soil remediation, there are so many depleted soils in, in, in this world now because of agriculture over years and years of intensive agricultural use and um, bringing biochar into that can really help restore the soil, um, adds carbon content to the soil, promotes water nutrient retention, microbial life even, which is very important in, in creating healthy soil and it, it can add nutrients. Um, so that means that farmers can cut back on that fertilizer bill and um, yeah, there have been also many stu many studies on yield increases being achieved by adding biochar. Um, there's evidence that it increases growth rate and health of fruit trees and grapevines when added to planting of new orchards. So, um, yeah, there's many, many different um, applications for biochar in agriculture. Let's um, pivot a little bit and talk about, uh, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this correctly, but Biosora. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's it. That's, that's the correct yeah. uh, pronunciation. So tell me like the idea behind it and what were the initial challenges you faced? Yeah, so it all started when, um, well, when I was studying sustainability in Barcelona and then I met some people um, from ESA Business School over there. And together we developed, well, one of them was Ines uh, Sarah Bosels and she is um, she's the CEO of Biosora right now. Um, and so we started out together just developing a business plan for a biochar business. Um, we took it to a startup accelerator called the Health Prize, which I've mentioned earlier, I think. Uh, we took it under the name Go Green and Grow. And then later we changed it to Biosori because we weren't getting a lot of traction on that name. <laughs> um, and then we got funding from Elon Musk's X Prize to really get that business off the ground. Um, so initially we struggled with our business plan, whether we would do a centralized biochar production or decentralized, where basically we would um, create a mobile production unit and take it farm to farm or do it on do it all on one site and then transport the feedstock to there and then the biochar from there. Um, we started, uh, oh, the technology was also a, a point of discussion where we we started out with a very low tech, simple open top kiln system. So it's a kiln is basically it's a glorified barbecue in a conical shape. 
um, where you just burn and it's open top. So you burn wood and then you put another layer on top where you're smothering the lower layer from oxygen. So there's no oxygen. The burning process can be become pyrolysis. Obviously, it's not foolproof, but it's uh, it's one of the more accessible um, methods um, for, for creating biochar. But eventually we traded that in for a more high tech unit that could give us more control over the process. Um, the biggest challenge, though, that we had was that we were in Barcelona and um, at the time our business was in Kenya. So we were running the whole thing from abroad, trying to build a team on the ground in Kenya when we weren't even there to oversee it, really. And that was the main challenge for us early on. So tell me a little bit more about uh, your move to Canada and, and, and the expansion to, to Kenya, because that's that's uh, interesting. Yeah. So. Actually, our initial idea was to start the business in Ghana. And so we contacted a local NGO that agreed to do the trials with us. We built our first kiln there, made connections with professors and labs. And then after a couple of months, we just decided to pivot to Kenya because we found that we had more connections and opportunities there. Um, so through my, well, through Inas's business school um, and also through the people we met along the way, um, Kenya seemed like the better um, opportunity. Uh, so we went to Kenya for the first time in January 2022, and we arranged meetings in Nairobi, and we interviewed people that were interested in working with us. And then also Ines went to check on the development of our first kiln there, and she met with potential partners in agriculture. Um, I didn't get to join her for that part because, unfortunately, I got COVID and had to quarantine. <laughs> so um, I wasn't there for that. But um uh, yeah, so after that first visit to Kenya, uh, the last semester at ESA, at ESA had started, so at their school it started. And my husband was actually also a student at ESA. That's, that's how I met Ines, basically. And we discussed moving to Kenya, but we decided against it as he had a different career path in mind and it would find it very difficult to pursue that in Kenya. So we decided we would move to Canada instead. And that's also when my involvement in Biosora ended, my full-time involvement at least. Um, at that point, Biosora was going to scale up rapidly and build a stronger team on site in, in Kenya. And for that particular phase, I found it to be crucial to be there in person. And um, when I moved to Canada, I couldn't be. So Inez has done a fantastic job of just um, growing Biosora since then. Good segue to the next set of questions I have. So, the, oh, more importantly, how have you? Because you know, moving is is a, is a big deal. So, how have you adjusted to North American chocolate versus Belgian chocolate? <laughs> well, um, I manage. <laughs> yeah, I, I I am a huge fan of Belgian chocolate, and I bring it um, I bring it with me every time I go home. But it's um, I've not lived in Belgium for a long time, so I've, I've learned to stock up whenever I do go home. And uh, Canadian chocolate isn't bad at all. So I'm pretty happy with that as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, Biosera today, so in terms of its operation and impact, do you, so do you, do you still have any involvement with it or is it are you fully done with that? Uh, I still have uh, involvement with Biosora as in um, advisory role. I, I, I'm willing to help Inaz out with problems if she, or specific tasks, if she, she's stretched for time, which she is a lot of the time. It's a very busy time for her. And as I said, Biosora is continuing to grow very rapidly. So they're expanding to a second facility soon. They're developing connections and agreements with farmers and agricultural businesses. Uh, they're now looking at um, purchasing two more production units and opening a second site. So they're and they are currently already the biggest biochar producers in East Africa, which is an incredible achievement only three years after we started the company. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to stay involved, happy to help out. And um, I keep, I'm getting regular updates from Inez. So uh, I'm watching from a distance. <laughs> awesome. Um, so let's talk a bit about like your future outlook. Um, what do you see as the future of nature-based solutions like biochar in the fight against climate change? I, what I think is that we're, we're going to need all the help we can get in this fight against climate change. So 
all and every measure that can limit emissions or better yet remove existing greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. All those measures are important and it just so happens that many of those measures are provided to us from, from nature. So the ocean is just an incredible carbon sink. There are many projects restoring reef and ocean ecosystems. Um, there's also great innovative ideas on that front, um, such as I recently came across a company that creates buoys made up of algae. That seems um, algae seeds that allow the algae to grow capturing carbon through photosynthesis and then when they're big enough the buoy sinks to the ocean floor and sequesters the carbon there i thought that's a very interesting idea to do um but still one of the most popular and widespread one of these nature-based solutions is biochar and the reason for that is that it's just really effective for long-term carbon sequestration and it also helps with waste management so there's also that um so it has so many benefits um creating resilience of the soil, waste management, carbon capture, carbon sequestration. Um, so because of all that um, and its yield increases, there's really only benefits to it. And that I think is what makes it such a unique product. And that's why I think it's gaining such popularity really quickly and rightly so. Yeah. So for you know, reflecting on your journey, what advice would you give to others looking to make a difference in sustainability and technology? Um, well, I, there's so many things you can do. It, it doesn't have to be like on a large scale immediately. Um, people tend to be extremely ambitious from the start and think, okay, if I can't like reduce if I can't take a gigaton out of the atmosphere, then what's the point? Gigaton of CO2, what's the point? But that's not really true. If you find something that you're interested in, explore it. You can make your own biochar, like you said, in your backyard, um, if you're into gardening, or you can just buy it off of Amazon and, and start growing veggie, veggies. And we started by building the smallest size kiln possible in Ghana. I think it was only like this big. Um, and it was the only thing we could afford at the time. And we kind of grew from there and reached, I mean, incredible potential. Um, it, it, yeah, it scaled up really quickly and that's, that's lucky, but it's, it wasn't this grand idea from the start. You can start really small. And, um, what, what I also found was really helpful is, is trying to connect with people that are equally interested in, in your passions. And it, I find it's amazing how much people want to help and support you. And, um, we've managed to build a great network of like-minded people. And that really does go a long way in helping you succeed, I think. Awesome. Um, so let's have a little fun now and learn more about you as a person. So is there any sort of like routines that you follow a favorite book you're reading, anything uh, fun you could share? So I've, um, I've read up a lot of, I've read a lot of articles on biochar and journals and, um, I've, what I did was reach out to a lot of people. So professors in the field, um, real experts on biochar that could teach me a lot. And I've had many Zoom conversations with them, just just being humble and wanting to learn, I guess, not really, because um, there's so many people that know so much more than I do. And I think that's the key, just always, always learning more and always being open to learn more. And, and that's, that's part of the excitement as well as you're never done. There's always, always more things to discover. Um, so that's, what's helped me. Um, I think a lot in the, the biochar story as well. Cool. As we're getting ready to wrap up, uh, what's the best way for people to connect with you, Sophie? I'm on LinkedIn, so you can reach me there, but LinkedIn is, is a sure way to reach me. And, um, if you want to know more about Biosora, there's a, they have a website, biosora, biosora.com. They're also on LinkedIn, um, sharing regular updates on the progress, um, of the company and the projects. And, um, they're also on Instagram, um, with, uh, fun photos and updates as well. So, uh, yeah, I recommend reaching out that way as well. Well, thank you very much for joining today. I'm definitely going to try to make my own biochar for my garden this summer. Um, I am also going to try to, uh, better pronounce uh, pyrolysis better since I butchered that throughout the whole <laughs> it's a <tricky> conversation. <laughs> um, thank you again. Uh, I'll be sure to include all those details for people to connect and uh, thank you for joining. 
Thank you very much. Thanks, Pat. Take care.